Welcome to Daily Living with Father Chapin, where we consider God's Word and how we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Yes, my friend, that is what we do. Sometimes the Bible can be a bit confusing, so we bust it down like a fraction. We're asking questions along the way. Questions like, hey, what do these Gospels have to do with me? That's what I want to know. How can I take these Gospels? They come to me each and every week and apply them into my daily living so that I can become a reflection of God's love to a world, let's face it, don't know God for sure and definitely is in deep need of more love. Don't you think? I mean, take a look around, my friend. There's a lot of bad news out there. How can I take the good news and apply it into my daily living so that I can become, well, a light in that darkness? I want to be a tool in the hand of God making present His kingdom. Not someday, but today and every day. That's what this show is all about. Now I'm so glad that you could join us today. Oh, we got a good one. But before we do, let's focus. Let's put ourselves in the presence of God. You know, the good news about the good news is God wants to lead you, and He does this through the quiet voice. Many, many ways, but one very powerful way he does it is through his word, because you see, scripture is alive. It will speak to you. Often I will have people say, well, God never really talks to me. Well, I don't know. Are you listening? Are you listening? Maybe God's been trying to get your attention for a long time. Do we have ears to hear the message? Do we have eyes to see what God would have us see? Today's lesson is really big, really big. So I ask you, maybe you take some notes, because this one, this one's deep. We're going to the deep end of the pool, my friend. This is what it means to be a Christian. This, this is the road map. And we're hearing from Matthew. It's the Beatitudes. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The gospel of the Lord, and what a gospel it is. Oh, my friend, there is a whole lot here, okay? whole lot to unpack. So what do you say? You come right on back and we're going to do that. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. and you hang out. We're going to talk about this gospel and a few other things along the way here as we unpack God's Word and how it is that we might be able to apply it into our daily living. Welcome back to Daily Living. On the eighth day of Christmas, my true love gave to me. Anybody? Eight maids of milking, right? Did you know that those eight maids of milking represent the eight Beatitudes from the Sermon on the Mount, which is the gospel you just heard? Because that's a secret song that teaches the faith. And just as Moses came off the mountain with the Ten Commandments, which, by the way, are the ten lords of leaping, to teach us how to live as a human being, right? Jesus today comes off the mountain with the Beatitudes, which is a playbook, uh, a guide on how to manifest the kingdom in our lives. This is what a Christian looks like. Now, before we get into this, I, I want to make just a few introductory comments. First of all, let me say that these eight Beatitudes 
which you're about ready to hear, they build on one another. They're very much interconnected. Think of them like a stairwell, okay? The further you climb, the more difficult they become. And, and, and since they build on one another, one cannot master a step until they have fully mastered the preceding step, right? And the further one masters the steps, the more fully one manifests the kingdom in their lives. To the point that if you reach the top of the stairwell, martyrdom will not even shake you, right? Starting with the aforementioned Ten Commandments. Our relationship with God has been primarily based on what not to do, right? Isn't that true? Most of the Ten Commandments start out with thou shall not. The Jewish tradition was born out of this belief. The relationship with God was based on thou shall not. So from this, they developed over 600 laws of what not to do. The Torah is a record of the interpretations of the law. It was handed down through generations and following the law and its many complex interpretations was how you kept God happy. It's what you needed to do to avoid the wrath of God. So we have a relationship here that is based on fear, which of course is nothing new. It's not limited to just the Jewish faith. Many of us have grown up in church hearing that the wages of sin are death, and the road to hell is wide. If you do this or you do not do that, you're going to go to hell. Consequently, our relationship with God is based on fear. What not to do. Consequently, many of our prayers fall into the begging variety. We get on our knees and we're asking God, please take care of my family. Take care uh, of myself and, and prosper my labor most importantly, protect me from the consequences of my own sin. For many of us, the prevailing message of Christianity is judgment, which leaves many of us uncomfortable. And rather than embrace the message of a conscious contact with your Creator, we reject out of hand what seems to be a callous threat. So I have a question. If as, quit, <laughs> as Christians, we are so aware of what God doesn't want us to do, what not to do, okay? What is our message in regards to what God wants us to do? What is his hope for us? He created us in his image. What are God's expectations? Well, welcome to the Beatitudes. A roadmap to what God wants. In short, the secrets to life. Blessed are the poor. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are. Now there's eight Beatitudes. And like I said, they all build on each other like a stairwell. Okay, but they all begin with this word blessed. It means holy. It means consecrated. But it also means enjoying great happiness. It also means bringing comfort or joy. Because you see, blessed is a whole lot more than just being happy. And, I've, and I have seen translations of this very gospel that say, happy the poor in spirit. And I'll tell you, that's just wrong. <laughs> that's wrong because blessed is very different than being happy. Happy is a fleeting temporary emotion based on external circumstances. Blessed, on the other hand, is an eternal experience based on internal circumstances. Blessed is that ultimate well-being. It's, it's supernatural, a, a well-being that bubbles up within us, spiritual joy. In, in a word, the secret to life. It's the peace that Jesus talks about when he says, peace I leave you, my peace I give you, not as the world gives it, do I give it to you. It's a, it's a peace that goes beyond all human understanding. It's a peace that no matter what your situation might be, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter how big the waves might be, and no matter how small your boat might be, okay, it's a sense of serenity, resting in the sure knowledge that not only is Jesus aware of this storm, he's in your boat, my friend. It's a peace that in the face of tragedy, you will be given a God-given ability to bring comfort to other people. So, like I said, it's a whole lot more than just being happy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs will be the kingdom 
of heaven. So joy is found in spiritual poverty. So where do we, where, where do we even begin with this? First of all, let me, let me just start by saying this has nothing to do with money. Okay, I know that when we hear the word poor, we think of lack of money, but this is spiritual poverty. Poor in spirit is the realization that you are in need, right? That, that you need God, which is in direct contrast with the spiritually proud of this world, the religion of our day. Keep the laws, you will be self-sufficient, and God is going to like you, which makes no sense when you consider the fact that Jesus says, those who are well do not need a physician, but the sick do. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, poor in spirit is realizing that you are in fact a sinner and that you are in fact sick. I mean, think about it. I mean, if you view yourself as healthy, what would you need Jesus for? But this is our world. Our world says, blessed are the rich and famous. Our world says, blessed are the spiritually self-sufficient. Our world says, blessed are the people that are making it happen, right? I mean, that's our world. Jesus says the very opposite. You will never be blessed until you see your poverty in spirit. We will never learn to lean upon God until we understand how much we actually need him. There is a reason that this is the first step. The utter dependence upon God is foundational. It's the principle upon which the entire lesson stands. You don't get this, you don't get anything else, which is unfortunate because many of us don't get this. As a result, many of us don't get past this first step. Consequently, many of us don't even get on the board. Blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Joy and sadness. Again, that's a paradox. How can happiness be found in a place of sadness? Now, I know we hear this, blessed are those who mourn at funerals from time to time. I don't know if that's necessarily what Jesus was getting at. I don't think that's a context. I don't think that Jesus is talking about worldly sorrow here. Sorrow. Sorrow here. I don't, I don't think he's talking about worldly sorrow. I don't think he's talking about mourning a physical death. I mean, consider Paul in 2 Corinthians. What does he say? For godly sorrow produces a salutary repentance without regret. But worldly sorrow produces death, which would seem to suggest that Jesus might be talking about mourning of our sins. The mourning of our sinfulness. Blessed are those who mourn. Do we mourn our own sinfulness? I would suggest to you that many of us do not mourn our own sinfulness because we do not understand our own sinfulness. Isn't that true? Consequently, we should view this as a clarion call to awake from our spiritual slumber. Blessed are they who mourn. Why? Why are they blessed? Well, I'll tell you why they're blessed. Because it is only those who are mourning of their sin who can be forgiven of their sin. Isn't that true? I mean, it is only once we recognize our sin that we can be truly forgiven for that sin. So I think what Jesus is trying to suggest here is instead of bringing your lamb to the temple for atonement for your sin, which would be our equivalent to going to church, okay, we might want to search ourselves and recognize that our sin is crippling us as it separates us from the love of our Father. Blessed are the meek, they will inherit the land. Joy is found in humility. Blessed are the meek. Well, I'll tell you what, our world has a real problem with this one because to the modern mind, meekness is a quality to be avoided. To the modern mind, meekness is weakness. But that's not true. Meekness is not weakness. The, re the, the, the root word of meek is found in Old English. It's a word that was associated with horses. So it was a word that was equestrian in nature. For example, if I were to say saddle or bridle or stirrup, you would know that I would be talking about a horse. Well, meek was used in the same way to describe a wild stallion that is completely obedient to its master. Meekness is power under complete control. So given that definition, can I do that? 
Can, can I do that? If I'm going to call myself a Christian, if I'm going to wave that flag, okay, can I turn the other cheek when someone slaps me unjustly? Do I have the self-control that I would be able to give back good for evil? Could I walk that second mile when someone's forcing me to walk the first? Okay, that's meekness. Meekness says, I'm going to do what is best for you, even though you don't deserve it. Meekness is power under control. Not an easy thing to do, okay? Not an easy thing to do. God's will sometimes is not easy. I mean, it's easy to do God's will when it's easy, but sometimes it's not, right? What about when it's hard? Well, this is a secret to life. If we are meek, we are strong. And we are blessed. This is Daily Living on Father Chapin. You stick around. We'll be right back. And we're going to continue to talk about these amazing Beatitudes here on Daily Living. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. Let me say, first of all, it's an absolute pleasure to be able to come into your home each and every week and talk about the Gospels of Jesus Christ. But it's a bit expensive. And if you feel like you're being fed in this ministry, you'd like to support us, please consider a gift to Daily Living at 325 West Main Street, White Sulphur Springs, West Virginia, 24986. Welcome back to Daily Living. Now, just for the break, we were talking about how when we are meek, we are strong. And when we are strong, we are blessed. It's hard to do. Like, like I told you, these steps get harder the further you get into it. But hold on there, Sparky. It's about ready to get real hard. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Joy is found where there is hunger. Now, this is big. We could talk about this for an hour. Let me just start by saying this has nothing to do with food, okay? Where do you even begin? Let me begin with a question. Are we spiritually mature enough that when we are faced in this world with all manner of evil and injustice, that we can rest in the knowledge that God is going to make it right? God is a just God. No matter how things might look or seem to be playing out in this world, there will be perfect justice and perfect righteousness. Can we put down the sword and let God be God? Can we trust him when he says, vengeance is mine. Here's another secret to life. If we are going to fight the battle, we should not expect to be blessed. But if we turn over our will to God, get our hands off it, let God be God, then we will be blessed. Like I said, it's hard, but it's getting even harder. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Joy is found in mercy. This is huge. Huge. Mercy is something that we all struggle with. Now, I think it's pretty you know, safe to say that we all consider mercy a blessing when we receive it, okay? But here Jesus is saying, no, no, no. Blessed are you when you give it. We're all looking for mercy, but it's so hard for many of us to show it to others. And that is because when injustice slaps us in the face, mercy is not the first thing that comes to mind. All of us have experienced pain. All of us have experienced unhappiness. All of us have been treated unjustly. Some of us live with this for many, many years. We are a people who are walking wounded, all right? Uh, but listen carefully, because I want you to really hear this, okay? This is a major secret to life. Lean over, okay, you ready? You will never feel peace until you finally forgive the person who has hurt you so deeply. Can I say that again? You will never feel peace until you finally forgive the person that has hurt you so deeply. That is hard to do. Okay, this is not easy. But like I said, I've said it before, resentment is exactly like eating small spoonfuls of rat poison every day and hoping that the other person dies. Okay, meanwhile, they're across town sleeping like a baby because newsflash, they have forgotten about it. They don't care about you and they never did. Okay, meanwhile, you're lying in bed thinking all this stuff, rehearsing all these conversations that you'll never have and you're getting sicker and sicker and sicker. But if you take it to God then you ask him, to take it from you. And then hear me now, because this is really important. Let 
it go. So many of us, oh, I really, I just, I really could, I wish I could just let it go. But then we continue to hold on to it like it's our security blanket. But if we actually do allow God to take it from us, guess what? We will be blessed. Like I said, it's not easy. But don't worry, it's getting harder. <laughs> okay. This might take you weeks, maybe months of prayer. But in the end, if we can show mercy, we will be blessed. And another thing, while we're talking about this whole forgiven thing, okay, maybe we should be asking ourselves this question. If Christ can forgive me, how can I not forgive others? I mean, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive others. I mean, put it right there, okay? Right there, this is very important. If we want to be blessed, we must forgive Okay, now we're moving into gradual level stuff. Oh, it's going to get really hard now. This is real tough. Okay, remember, these steps build upon each other. There's no way you're going to be able to master this next step until you get the first four down. Okay, blessed are the pure of heart, for they will see God. Joy is found in purity. Now, of course, as I was growing up, I was taught that the wages of sin were death. And I was taught that the road to hell was paved with sex, drugs, and rock and roll, which, of course, immediately makes those things look interesting. You know, the whole forbidden fruit thing. Remember, Eve was enticed because the fruit looked good. It was pleasing to the eye, okay? We all fall. We are all sinners. What is your secret habitual sin? Maybe it's victimless. Maybe it's something you do on the internet, okay? Maybe it's some overindulgence. Whatever it is, it is quietly killing you. We all struggle with it. Jesus says here very clearly, okay, this world doesn't place a very high premium on purity for sure, but purity brings its own reward. This is another secret to life. And remember, this is tough. This is graduate level stuff. If we strive for purity in this fallen world, we will be Blessed. Strive for a pure heart and you will be blessed. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Joy is found in conflict. Now, notice, Jesus doesn't say blessed are the peace lovers. Everybody loves peace, right? We are all desperately trying to avoid conflict. I mean, you, you'll hear stories in the news where there's horrible crime and there's, there's no witnesses. Oh, really? I mean, somebody can be mugged in broad daylight in front of crowds and nobody steps forward. Why? Because they love peace. They don't want to get involved. This is not about loving peace. This is about making peace, which often requires stepping into the middle of conflict, okay? Reconciliation requires confrontation. But a peace lover will avoid confrontation. A peacemaker will enter into the chaos in the shadow of God and come out on the other side with the fruit of reconciliation. But like I said, this is gradual level stuff, okay? And hear me when I say, I want to make this very clear. Unless your spiritual condition is strong, unless you're acting in pure humility, don't go there. Don't, do not go walking into some kind of conflict without the armor of the Spirit. You go wandering into some conflict without the blessing of God, you're liable to get kicked around a bit, okay? But the spirit-filled Christian can enter into conflict with truth and compassion. He or she will bring empathy and respect, and in doing so, can resolve the conflict that the world looks as seemingly impossible to resolve. Secret of life, my friend, but it requires one to be spiritually fit. It's hard to do. There's a reason it's near the very top. Blessed are the peacemakers. Finally, we get to the top, okay? The pinnacle. The pinnacle of the teachings of how we can manifest the kingdom of God in our lives, right? Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and, and, and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven because joy is found in mistreatment. Now, I, I got to tell you, <laughs> I don't care how many years you read this particular line in Scripture, it's still shocking. I mean, imagine the first people that ever heard this. I mean, this statement is a huge surprise. I mean, there all, all these statements are surprising, okay? But this one, it's just over the top, okay? And you know why? Because human beings 
view suffering as an indication that something is wrong. And Jesus is suggesting here that sometimes suffering and mistreatment is an indication that something is right. People hated Jesus. They continue to hate Jesus today. They don't like what he stands for. Therefore, they're going to hate us. Can we take a stand? And if we do, are we ready if it's going to cost us? Yes, my friend. Sometimes when we take a stand for Jesus, it will cost us. But those who are effectively living the Christian life will live through difficulty and hardship. Like I said, this is tough stuff. But let me tell you, when it, when it comes to the unholy trinity of me, myself, and I, this is not going to get done. We will fail every time because we don't do persecution really well. But if we hold on to these spiritual principles and turn our will over to the Spirit, we will be blessed. In and of myself, I cannot live the Christian life. I cannot follow these steps. But the Christ who lives in me and through me can. And if I allow him, we'll be able to stand in the face of anything. Secret to life, folks. You want to know what God wants? Jesus is telling us all about it right here. You know, every day in this country, somebody does something nice for somebody else. Today, why don't you let that somebody be you? This is Daily Living. I'm Father Chapin. Hope you can come back next week and we'll do it again. Until then, I hope you let God live in your life. And I bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Hi, this is Father Chapin, host of Daily Living with Father Chapin. want to talk to you briefly about a subject that you know, I don't feel real comfortable about, and that's the subject of money. But unfortunately, money is required to come to you each and every week. And if you're getting fed by this ministry and you'd like to support us, please consider a gift to Daily Living at 325 West Main Street, White Sulphur Springs, 24986.